Two of the most essential mentors in my life were women, my mother and my grandmother. They both instilled in me the need to keep learning and growing personally and professionally to further enrich people by nourishing others. But before I was born, two other women would be a significant catalyst in my career and the career of tens of thousands. They would then go on to be responsible for educating future chefs who would go on to nourish others worldwide. In 1946, two women shared a daring vision to create the culinary center of the nation. A Connecticut-based attorney, Francis Roth, was one of the most influential pioneers in culinary education with support from co-founder Catherine Angel. Today, the Culinary Institute of America celebrates the 75th anniversary with campuses worldwide and online degree programs. The CIA is widely recognized as the world premier culinary college. Its reputation for excellence is evidenced by its president, outstanding faculty, passionate students, and more than 50,000 accomplished alumni. Joining us is one of today's leading culinarians and scholars, Dr. Tim Ryan, president of the Culinary Institute of America. As a master chef, educator, he is recognized as the pioneer in American cuisine movement, named one of the most 50 most powerful people in food. His thought leadership has guided the Culinary Institute of America to a position of prominence on such important matters as health, wellness, world flavors, food ethics, and sustainability. Dr. Ryan's presidency builds on his history of leadership in culinary education and the food service industry. Hi, Tim. It's such a pleasure having you with us today. <laughs> Hi, George. Great to see you. We're proud of you as one of our alumni, too. Well, thanks. I think the last time we were together, we were having lunch at your uh, Napa Valley Grayston, Grayston campus. And my right. goodness, you have gone on to just such amazing, amazing things for not just the alumni, but, but the, the whole food world. Um, First, first, let's start off. Give us, give us a, a background of the Culinary Institute because it's, it's enormous today. Well, you did a great job talking about our history. Of course, we started uh, humble beginnings, the end of the Second World War, these two dynamic uh, ladies, and uh, the New Haven Restaurant Association. Actually, the idea started with the New Haven Restaurant Association. And um, they knew that they were they were too busy and unable to really fulfill the dream so that's when they brought in mrs roth who brought in mrs angel and since that time of course we uh we th uh, thrived and uh on the yale campus in in new haven until the early 70s and we were busting at the seams we found this great campus former jesuit seminary in hyde park new york and bought it for one million dollars <laughs> Uh, 80 <laughs> acres, and George, you know, that's, that's a great real estate deal. <laughs> it's 88, was originally 80 acres, now it's 180 acres. And um, this has been uh, the home base for us for many years. And of course, now we have two campuses in California, a campus in San Antonio, Texas, one in Singapore. We have a castle in Italy for our students who are studying Italian food and culture in Puglia, the heel of the boot. Uh, we've got a campus in uh, Barcelona in partnership with the University of Barcelona and probably a couple other things that they haven't, uh, haven't told me about. From the original training program, the CIA, George, as you know, was, was originally intended to train veterans returning from the Second World War. And the early program was really only nine weeks of, of right. training. Yeah. And then it continued to expand from, from there. When we came to New York in the early 70s, we started to offer associate's degree programs. And then uh, starting in the 90s, we offered our first bachelor's program. Now we have multiple bachelor's programs, multiple master's programs. And, um, and it's been a fantastic journey. Uh, the CIA's growth and development uh, parallels in some ways uh, the profession and the food industry. Actually, we believe that we help to lead that, uh, that development, and that's really been core to our mission over these years, and it's still the idea that, that moves us forward and drives us. How can we better the profession? How can we better the industry? How can we help America and the world to mm -hmm. really eat, uh, eat better? 
Now, you, you mentioned about being masters. Well, I, I have to drill back to you now because your background is very unique, very unique in culinary education. Uh, foremost, being a master chef and uh, then going on for your doctorate. Just, right. just walk us through a little bit of that path. Well, um, George, as, as you know, because you've, you're certified by the American Culinary Federation, as I am, and have been involved with the ACF for, for a long time. So there's a certification process um, that culminates in the designation of certified master chef. <laughs> to be a certified master chef is quite different from, you know, people proclaim themselves or a mm -hmm. writer may proclaim somebody a master chef mm -hmm. kind of as an honorific thing or a compliment. There's actually a certification process, and um, there's a ladder that you uh, work your way up, getting uh, educational uh, credentials uh, to become a certified executive chef. And once you're at the certified executive chef level, you can qualify to take what in my day was a 10-day comprehensive mm -hmm. hands-on examination, 10 days of cooking and, and, uh, and testing. And if you passed uh, all those things in, in 10 days and the, the failure rate was about 90 percent, 95 percent. It's a it's a brutal test. It's like going for a it's black a belt. Test. <laughs> it's a brutal test. So there's lots of lots of attrition. And after, geez, I don't I don't remember now how many years we've been doing it. 30 years, I think 63, mm -hmm. 65 people have have prevailed and have that uh, certified master chef uh, credential. But once you get it, it's a great uh, it's a great thing to have. So, what what then led you down the path of uh, I'm I'm going to go for my my doctorate? Yeah, that's a you know that's a good question, and uh, I haven't thought about that for uh, for a while. Well, you know, <clears throat> uh, sometimes life takes you uh, down uh, unanticipated paths. And uh, that's surely the case for me. Uh, I um, had a completely different career path in mind, and I started down a, a different path. I didn't intend to become the president of the, of the CIA, of my alma mater. I wanted to be Paul Bocuse. Uh, Paul Bocuse is, uh, the, you know, I, I think the most important chef in, in history now. He passed away a couple years ago, a uh, French chef located in, in Lyon, France, and he, he for chefs, George, I know you know this, yes, but yes. Our, our listeners and viewers might not, um, to chefs particularly of, of my generation, um, Paul Bocuse was like Elvis Presley was yes. to the early rock stars. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was the man, and that's who everybody aspired to be. So that was my original career path, and I went to France, I worked for Paul, I worked for some of the other uh, great French chefs, I uh, came back to Pittsburgh. I opened a French restaurant. This is a truncated <laughs> version of my story, of course. Um, you know, I opened a French restaurant, great critical acclaim. Uh, we were very successful. And um, then I met my predecessor here at the CIA, a guy by the name of Ferdinand Metz. Ferdinand. And uh, you know Ferdinand. And uh, Ferdinand was uh, in Pittsburgh. That's my hometown. And he was in charge of all research and development at H.J. Hines Corporation. And he had just been named the, the new president of the CIA. And shortly after he, he was named, he called me up and said, I want to start this new American project here. And I'd, I'd, I'd love you to come and be a part of that. And I said, yeah, that's nice, but, you know, I'm... I've got this restaurant. I'm, you know, on this French thing. Nobody knew what George Umer. Nobody knew <laughs> was, what American cuisine was. It was revolutionary you know? back then. What is this <laughs> bounty thing? <laughs> exactly. Uh, hot dogs, hamburgers. What's American cuisine? And um, so originally I said no, but you know we kept in touch, and he kept uh, encouraging me. So ultimately I decided to come and do this American project, which culminated in the opening of the American Bounty Restaurant, one of the first American mm -hmm. restaurants. This was in early uh, 1980s. And I said, well, you know, uh, uh, this guy, Ferdinand, is very interesting. I love my alma mater. I think this will be an interesting mm -hmm. project for me. I'll do it for two years, and then I'll be back out trying to be Paul Bocuse. You know, I'm going <laughs> to learn a bunch of things. This is this sure. is really the story. But once I got here to the CIA, and George, I know you can relate to that to this. There, there's something magic about the place. Mm -hmm. 
And though I had experienced that as a student, to come back as a faculty member was a completely different thing. And, um, you know, you could sense and feel every day that you were making a difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And as I thought about it more, I said, you know, even if I do become the American Paul Bocuse, which was inconceivable at the time, Michelin didn't write or rank of restaurants course. here. I mean, it's yes. a long time ago. Um, you know, and I, and I saw wave after wave of graduating class leave the institution. I'm like, wow, you know, you can really make a difference here. I didn't really quite understand it as, as a student. So um, I got turned on by that. This is, a, this is a long answer to your story, but this is how, how it works. And um, uh, I went to Ferdinand and said very naively, I'm like, hey, guess what? Um, I've, I, I decided I'm going to stay here. I'm going to make a career here. And he looked at me like, you've been here for six months. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say that. to The his pension's parents. not ready yet. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I was in my 20s. And, he's, and I said, and I think that whenever you're done, I'd like to take over after you as president. This was like one of the most naive and, and bold, a lot of chutzpah there um, to say that. But to his credit, he said, that's a great idea. I like that. Uh, I'm going to be around for a while. Mm -hmm. you know, he was around for another 20 years sure, after that, by sure. the way. He said, but you're going to need to do a lot in order to get ready for that. Mm -hmm. and to prepare yourself and there's going to be no guarantees and i said okay i'm ready what you know tell me what i need to do and so over the next couple of weeks we developed like a list of i don't know probably 20 things to do including getting a certified master chef i was already on the culinary olympic mm -hmm. team at that time um he said you're gonna to have to be the captain so you're gonna to have to do more than when i was on the national team but you're going to have to be the captain. You're going to have to, I had an associate's degree then. You're going to have to get a bachelor's degree. You're going to mm -hmm. have to get an MBA. He said, I have an MBA. The next president will need to have a doctoral degree. Uh, and so I was like, oh, man, I, you know, wow, this is going to take forever. He goes, you have time. Right. And you just have to do it one step at a time. And there was a whole other list of things that we kind of developed. And uh, I said, okay, I've got time. <laughs> Let me start to um to to work on this on this list and um so that's what i did and well i think it's important to me a long time but i but yeah I yeah it, you know. but you planted the flag and i think yeah. that's yeah. A, a great life lesson and it's a great educational thing for even prospective students you need to plant yeah. the flag you need to plant the flag as far as where you're going to go in your in your craft and your career um i think that's that's good advice and and looking back that's exactly what i did i committed to that Though at the time, again, it was more out of kind of uh, um, youthful enthusiasm and uh, unrealistic uh, <laughs> expectations, brashness, chutzpah, um, but it worked out. Because I, I, I worked hard at it. I did follow through, and that's important, as you know. And you also uh, drove the bus to transforming the Culinary Institute, which was magnificent even during that time. But really brought it to like university level where it is today just just kind of give us a little bit of a track of of you know what what is taking place you know at the cia worldwide in your different programs well you you mentioned um the term thought leadership which is really important to us you know the, re the really great institutions um aren't just teaching uh things that were developed by others Mm -hmm. But they're writing the books, they're doing the research, they're doing the papers, they're really blazing new paths and, and new trails, um, many of which, in retrospect, seem absolutely obvious. That's when you know that you were really successful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the first path that the CIA really, uh, uh, you know, cut, the trail we blazed, was professionalizing the industry. And now it seems apparent, and chefs are stars, and they have TV shows, and and uh, write books, and get all these public accolades. But you know, even back in the 80s and 70s, and certainly the 60s and 50s, or when the school started, that wasn't true. That's and oftentimes true. the profession was looked down upon. Mm. Uh, the image was often a caricature. Uh, if you, I know George, I know you remember the old um, cartoon Beetle Bailey. Yeah. 
where yeah. Cookie was the sloppy mess sergeant, uh, and that was kind of the image that people had uh, of of chefs. So that was the first thing that CIA tried to do. You know, we're gonna we're gonna professionalize this uh, this group, um, and we're gonna have a, a you know a code that we follow, and we're going to one of the ways that you professionalize uh, an industry or a profession is through education. And what happens in professions is that um, as they progress, if they do progress, mm -hmm. um, the requirements for education become greater and greater and greater. And that's basically what we, uh, we have been doing. Um, we've been researching new things, we've been expanding the education, and we have been upping the ante for what is required uh, in, our, in our profession. And um, you know, my even my doctoral dissertation at the University of Pennsylvania was focused on that. You know, how do professions progress? What really happens? How can an institution of higher learning help accelerate that? Mm -hmm. What are past examples of it, and what does that mean for the CIA? And that's really the game plan that we've been following for you know the several decades of my my presidency now, and it's been thrilling. It's been very exciting. So, Tim, you know it's been uh, a few decades since uh, I attended there, but I've, I have a burning Time thought in my head, it, especially it? I knew we were, we were talking today. Sea dorm, my room looking over at Lake Valute. What, what kind of condition is that in today? I mean, it, <laughs> it's, a great, it's a great condition. It's a great condition. Uh, we still call the Lake Lake Valute. Um, and it's, it's funny you mentioned that. What was your room number? Do you remember, George? No, I don't. And I was trying to. I, 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 gosh. Okay, we have to. We are. It's like the second or third floor. It's got to be. We're going to research that. Yeah, it's got to be. Um, I, I did an interesting thing uh, recently. Uh, we just admitted our our fall freshman uh, class, the biggest class we've ever admitted, by the way. Mm -hmm. And particularly coming off of COVID, these students are so fired up and so sure. energetic and so positive. And so happy to be here. It's it's just uh, it's been a wonderful uh, wonderful thing. Anyhow, two young uh, students came up to me, uh, two two young men, and said, "Hey, guess what? We're in your old dorm room." <laughs> and uh, I said, "Now, nah, how, how would you even know my old dorm room? What what it was?" They said. It's uh, Angel, what we used to call a dorm. Okay. We eventually got around to naming the, uh, the dorms, <laughs> but in George in my day, you know, we're, there's a bunch of chefs here. It's just like A B C yeah, dorm. That's right. It. We got That's another it. thing to do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of reflection on things. Yes. We've got orders to get out. But uh, so these uh, these young guys said uh, A two twenty two. I said, well, that was my room. So they invited me to come down, and I hadn't been down there. I mean, I, I, I visit the dorms on occasion, but I'm not hanging out in, of in the dorm rooms. Yeah. And I went down to uh, my old dorm room, and we took pictures, and they sent it to their parents and, and all that. It was great. And, hey, you know, our, our uh, dorm rooms were very modern, very progressive back then, and we've, yeah. uh, we've continued to update them and, and modernize them. So it was great. It was uh, it was great, but I've been in my old dorm room re recently. And when you come back, we're going to find your room, <laughs> okay. and uh, you're going to visit it, and we'll put a little plaque up there. So, so through through my experience in visiting my old old room, we came up with the idea that we're going to uh, all of our notable alumni, and you know, there's a, there's a lot Quite included. A few. Yeah. We're we're going to put uh, whoever was in what room. We're going to put a plaque that these famous alumni lived in this in this. Uh, in this dorm room, and that'll be uh, that'll be fun for the students. Well, I think that's what makes you it really sp really special, Tim. Is you know all your accomplishments, and yet you're still able to be relatable to the most important thing, the students. Um, I want to thank you that's for right, joining us right, today. <laughs> it's just it's just been an honor and a pleasure, uh, and a personal just just that we've been able to to catch up. Absolutely, great to see you, George. Thank you. That was Dr. Tim Ryan, president of the Culinary Institute of America. For more information on the CIA programs, restaurants, visit ciachef.edu. As in any profession, a solid education builds a foundation that cannot be replicated. I've often been asked, how can I be a successful chef? It takes hard work, sacrifice, and continued professional development to rise in one's career. Whatever your interests, get as much experience as you possibly can, immersing yourself in its path.
I don't know about you, Alex, but I have a lot more to talk about. Oh, I had, I, yeah, off? I had a ton of questions, but you guys were doing such a good job of just telling the history and the story, and it was such a good, like, old classmate story. I didn't want to cut in with, you know, industry questions and stuff like that. But I, I think two things that really struck me that you said, Dr. Ryan, uh, and I, I've worked in restaurant kitchen since I was about 14, and I've worked with plenty of chefs uh, and cooks who all have been students at the CIA. Um, one of my Alex men- is also an alum of the River Cafe with Brad. Yeah, I worked at the River oh, Cafe okay. for about yeah. four years under Brad Steelman. And actually, going back to something that you said, one thing he taught me that I didn't know from being, you know, a line cook in my teens and early 20s was that sense of professionalism. It was when I got to the River Cafe that Brad told me, you can always tell how good a chef is by how clean his station is. You always have a clean jacket. You always have a clean apron. You always have a clean hat on. Um, But I see two types of people a lot of times who either want to go to or are going to culinary school. And there's one handful who are very driven and want to be chefs. They're like you. They want to be that next Bocuse or nowadays maybe the next Thomas Keller or Danielle. And then you see guys who might be in the industry and they don't want to be line cooks forever. And they kind of freak out and, and start looking to other industries. And I think one thing the three of us have done is started with careers in the restaurant or hotel industry. And then branch that out into other areas of food. What would you say to prospective students about the potentials of a culinary career that is outside of just being a line cook? Well, I really believe that the food service industry is uh, an industry of of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that firsthand because I've experienced it myself. And I came from a very poor background. And um, by choosing the right profession and getting um, a good education, uh, all kinds of doors open for me. <clears throat> Today, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a chef, though those culinary skills and those fundamentals are invaluable, and they'll, they'll always serve you well. But our alumni go in all kinds of directions, and they're heading hotel companies and research and development operations. They're entrepreneurs. They're media stars and celebrities. They're authors. They're consultants. They're financial analysts and everything in between. I mean, there's so many paths that you can go down. One of the things that we always say is, and this this sounds funny, and it is, but but it's true, is that uh, our research shows that 100% of the world eats food. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and, and food's recession-proof. So <laughs> the, the opp- right. The opportunities are endless and abundant and, and worldwide. So it's a fantastic career to get in. And our curriculum has changed and morphed and adapted to, uh, to accommodate that. You know, it's not just when George and I were, were uh, students um, pretty much everybody started out as, you know, you went, you went and you worked in restaurants or maybe a hotel or, or a club, but you were in the kitchen. Yeah. And that was going to be yeah. your, your career path. Like the big choice was, the, you know, were you going to be pastry or were you going right. to be a chef? Um, now students have so many choices. It's, it's dizzying uh, what it is that, uh, that they can do. And, you know, we've layered on all kinds of choices and all kinds of programs for them to explore those, those different options. Um, of course, <clears throat> one of the big things that we did, you know, back in the 90s, we saw that um, kind of my generation, George's generation, George is a little bit younger than me, but, um, you know, we started out as chefs and then we wanted to be entrepreneurs, inspired by the, the chefs uh, in France in particular, like Paul Bocuse. We wanted to own our own restaurants and mm-hmm. be our own bosses. But what happened was that oftentimes the chefs uh, didn't have the business skills yeah. or they relied on partners who often took advantage of them, took all their money away, took their names away from them. And so I said, well, wait a second, we've got to provide chefs with the business background, the mm-hmm. business acumen. And that's originally why we started the bachelor's uh, degree. And then we saw there were so many other opportunities and we just saw our graduates experiencing the power of education, of more education, and seeing how that opened other possibilities for them, that we continue to expand and grow and provide new offerings. And we'll continue to do that because the, the opportunities in, 
in the world of food are endless. Well, I think that another important thing to think about is the other side of traditional colleges and universities is a lot of people come out with generalized degrees, and the ones who really make it in the real world are ones who are specialized. So even if you have some type of business degree, or for myself, I have a journalism degree, what has been able to let me set myself apart is the specialization in food. And I think that getting a degree at a place like the CIA gives you a specialization and a real intimate knowledge of the food industry that other universities can't, even if you want to be, say, in the business or the writing aspect of things. I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And one of the other things, this is a very real world institution. Uh, we've never lost the idea, even though we have, you know, all these theoretical courses mm -hmm. and there's liberal arts taught here and uh, all kinds of, of things. We've never lost the idea that we're preparing people for a specific industry, which is to your, to your point. And I can't tell you how many times on, on graduation day um, parents come up to me and say, I, I don't know what you did to George while he was here. <laughs> this is a different kid that we sent away to you, and we mean that, you know, in the most positive way. He's focused, he's, you know, hardworking, he's organized, and, and so on and so forth, because that's part of the culture here, and that's part of what we teach. One of the, one of the concepts, the ideas that we, we uh, most often stress is one of the first things we ever ta teach students is uh, the phrase mise en place, which is French for everything in its place. And that's not just organizing your station efficiently, but that's everything you do, yeah. a constant state of preparation, of thinking ahead, mm -hmm. being, being ready. And um, once you practice that in the kitchen, you say, wow, this is really kind of a magical thing. It permeates into the rest of your life. And I think it's, li it's life changing. Now, the CIA is a lot more than just training for professional chefs or people in the hospitality industry. Uh, there are people that, that visit from all over the world because of your hospitality. Uh, share some of the, the venues and the things that just everyday people who are not going to go for a culinary degree can um, take away from the Culinary Institute. Well, all of our uh, domestic campuses are in um, fantastic locations that are known for food and beverage, wine, hospitality. So the main campus here in uh, the beautiful Hudson Valley, a great wine region, great agricultural uh, region. Um, the CIA here in, in Hyde Park is the largest tourist destination between New York City and Niagara Falls. So uh, we get hundreds of thousands of visitors that visit our restaurants, that take short courses. We offer uh, a whole host of short courses that the you know the amateur the food enthusiast somebody who's interested but doesn't want to be a professional can um, take advantage of they take tours that that have uh, sensory exercises you know we teach them how to taste like a chef and and things like that so there's all kinds of ways that a visitor um, can engage with the CIA in uh, in a different level um, We've got two campuses in, in Napa Valley, so if you want to take wine courses, uh, if you want to take cooking courses, short courses, even uh, at our Copia facility, we have a, a really cool kind of experimental thing. It's a 3D dining experience, so mm. you're in this kind of white box of a, of a room and using technology. We're serving a meal, but it's like a immersive show, so all around you at one point, like, the whole place is like you're you're riding on an ocean. And then you're in the desert. And then you're in the <laughs> Himalaya mountains. It's a mind blower. Wow. It is it is so good. New York Times called our Copia campus um, a, a foodie wonderland. So it's not just for the professionals, but plenty of people who are just interested or just love food uh, go there. And San Antonio, we're right on the San Antonio River uh, River, right at the end of the uh, the world famous uh, River Walk. And so we offer the same things. We have a student-run restaurant. We have classes for enthusiasts. We have tours. And um, lots of people take advantage of it. And it makes, you know, it, it helps to enliven the campus. The students are already providing tons of energy, and there's always an electricity and buzz. But when you add all these visitors to it, it's just a really, really dynamic and fun thing. One thing I'd like to ask you, uh, Tim, uh, because I know my own experience uh, you know, I developed and ran and built a culinary school. We were actually a good feeder to the CIA for students that wanted to go on. But 
students that would still come back and still do come back to me, you know, 25, 30 years later, and you realize, wow, I've really made an impact in someone's life. Any of those moments stick out to you? Oh, boy. You know, you're so right. And, um, and there's, a, there's a ton of them. And sometimes when you're engaged with a student, you're, uh, you're helping him or, or her. I mean, you know it's making a difference, and they'll come back years later. And there's, I'm not going to name a bunch of names of living people. Because you'll, you'll leave out, out 55,000 other people. Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's a bunch of people out there that who are super successful and they're superstars now. And you know, I, I pick them out on orientation day, uh, or they approach me in the hall, or they came and said, "Hey, I'm in your room," like these young guys this week, or mm -hmm. or whatever. And you just ne you know, sometimes you know, but there's occasions where you know you've done something with somebody and you didn't know you made an impact. And uh, then years later, they come back. I I'll tell you about one of our alums who, who passed away, but he's, he's a legend. It was like that. So when I was teaching in the American Bounty uh, 100 years ago, um, mm -hmm. there was a, a young guy. He was, he was good. I, I liked him. He was in my class. And he came up and he said, hey, chef, what do you think uh, I should do? I'm, I'm, I'm going to graduate soon. And I'm trying to decide whether I, I go to work in New Orleans or New Jersey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the big Springsteen, big, big New Jersey Pit fan. <laughs> Pittsburgh wasn't even on the table, huh? <laughs> no, Pittsburgh wasn't on the table. So I said, hmm, that's an interesting choice. Yeah. New Jersey or New Orleans. What, you know, what, I, I get why you want to go to uh, New Orleans, but what, what is going to take you to, to New Jersey? He goes, well, I've got a girlfriend down there, and, you know, maybe I go and hang out with her. And I said, well, okay. I said, uh, well, you think this is the one? Or are you going to marry her? And he said, eh, probably not. I said, go to New Orleans then. Uh, I'm going to connect you with the Brennan family. And, wow. um, you know, go to Commander's Palace. So he went, and there was a young chef, brand new guy, had just been promoted as chef at Commander's Palace, Emeril Lagasse. Oh, sure. <laughs> and our student, Jamie Shannon, went down there and quickly became his sous chef. And when Emeril went to pursue his... Uh, TV career, mm -hmm. Jamie became the uh, the executive chef. Now, I wasn't in contact with him, so the day he, uh, or the week he became the executive chef of Commander's Palace, which is probably, you know, 10 years after he and I have this conversation in the kitchen, he comes back, and um, it's a career fair here, and he says, hey, chef, do you remember me? And I'm, I, you know, I had a lot of sense. I'm like, you know, I, I remember, I do remember you, but but help me out. He goes, Jamie Shannon. I'm like, oh, okay, that's right, Jamie. He says, hey, I just want to tell you that, do you remember this conversation we had in the kitchen about 10 years ago? And I did remember it. And I did remember connecting him. He said, I was just made this week the executive chef of Commander's Palace. So it was just a little interaction. I mean, I had him in class. Life-changing. And yeah. he said that, that was a life-changing yeah. event for me. And I came all the way back just to thank you. I was really blown away by that. I, you know, I always remembered that. So, George, you're, you've experienced this, too. Uh, you know, we're, we're changing people's lives every day. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you, you know, how energizing that is and how, how good it feels mm -hmm. really to, uh, to make a difference. And, and you do. And I'm very happy to say this right now. Uh, before we go, I just want to say, Dr. Tim Ryan, I love saying that because I just know you as Tim, and I'm just so right. proud of everything that you have done and the school. Uh, uh, it was a life-changing moment for myself in my career and uh, very fond memories, and it won't be long before I'm up there. We're going to visit your dorm room together. Okay. <laughs>